Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig, it's nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And today I am interviewing somebody who is a bit of a legend in the UK magic community. Uh, this is somebody who's a creator and innovator. He's created effects that are used by magicians literally all over the world. I've seen him lecture, he's got an incredible lecture. But on top of all of that, he is somebody who is a really good business person in magic you don't you very rarely, rarely see that you rarely see people who magicians aren't great business people this is somebody who gets the business side of magic and is also a great performer as well he's a very rare breed i'm so excited to have him on the channel i am of course talking about the one and only sean goodman how are you doing sean i'm great i'm thinking great who the hell is he talking about i'm loving it <laughs> sure. i mean the first time you and i chatted many many years ago was uh, when we were talking about BNI because obviously yeah. you were BNI for years. I don't know if you still are, but you're a member for BNI for years. And all I heard when I heard that you're a member of BNI, I was like, okay, this is obviously somebody who gets the business side of things because you're not going to spend money on a BNI membership without understanding the value of branding and marketing and putting yourself out there. And you know, just you telling me that all those years ago sp spoke volumes to me about the type of person you are. So, you know, I mean, it's, uh, we'll, we can get into this during the interview, but, yeah. you know. Happy to chat about that, yep. It'd be really good, but you know, I'm really, I mean, you're very busy, um, which is even busier since lockdown obviously has ended as we all are. Mm. And I'm so glad that you found time to do this because I, I, I love, I, 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 although we know each other, I don't know the ins and outs. And I'm going to find this in this interview. Normally, when I interview people, I kind of know most of it. And I'm, but I, I'm kind of going blind with a lot of this. I know you've no. reputation, we've chatted a few times, I know your effects, but I don't really know you. So, this is going to be really fun for me. And we're yeah. going to start, I always start every interview, Sean, which is the origin story. Very quickly, what got you into magic, my friend? How old were you? How did that all come to be? Yeah, absolutely. So I started, there was years ago, because I'm a little bit older than you, only a little bit. Um, and there was a there was a TV programme called The Magician that starred a guy called Bill Bixby. Bill who Bixby. Later became, I, I remember seeing reruns later on, The Incredible okay. Hulk, right? Yeah, so he, he became more famous as being The Incredible Hulk, not the green, muscly one, but the David Banner character. But he was a, a keen amateur magician. And basically this program, The Magician, was him in this role as the magician. And he was using his magical skills to help solve crimes. And I was a 10-year-old boy at the time watching this. And, and at the time, of course, there wasn't YouTube or anything like that. There was just stuff on the TV. And, and I was thinking, I was watching this guy and he was suave, sophisticated, he was rich. He had these flashy cars. He had the women falling at his feet. So 10 year old boy, obviously, I thought this magician like looks all right. So and that was it. And so I got hooked in. And, and at the time, I don't know if they still do them now, fan clubs. So I wanted to join Bill Bixby's fan club. But I didn't know how to do this. And I went on holiday to Jersey and I met another lad called Vaughan. So it was like Vaughan and Sean we both loved the magician and and he said i can give you the details of bill bixby's fan club so i went great he said or i can teach you a magic trick i never got bill bixby's fan club details but he taught me the three pile 21 card trick and that was it i was i was hooked and and off i went and i started performing this thing over and over and over again to whoever had a pulse and I think that that's actually something that's lived with me for a long time because when I get an effect you do it as you well know Craig you do it over and over and over again until it looks as though you're doing it just naturally and it, things don't happen but people don't see the hours of work that go behind the scenes so that's how I got started. Wow so you're 10 years old You've learned the 21 card trick. You're showing it to everybody. Did you, uh, did you carry on through school? Did, you, did it become an obsession like a lot yeah. of people? Um, because I've spoken to a lot of people I interview and they go, oh, my, my interest dropped off and then came back later on. Or were you just full on? No, I was, I was a sad one, yeah. So I, again, we didn't have YouTube. So the only thing we had were libraries. So I went into libraries and I got books out on magic and this is why 
I think I prefer as a learning medium myself, I prefer books based on obviously that I used to read lots of books when I was young and I still do. And I love the book scene because uh, videos are great as well because you've got visual, but I see a lot of magicians and they also, they almost like become a stereotype of the person performing, whereas a book just gives you the bare bones and then you add your, your flavor to it. So I just went along and I got loads and loads of books out and that's how I started learning magic and most of my stuff at the beginning was pretty much card trick after card trick after card trick after card trick which sounds a bit familiar to many magicians out there nothing wrong with that but that's how I got started and and so yeah I I was constant throughout school and I think one of the things that magic is really good for is it develops people's presentation skills and it develops their self-confidence so for me, that was a real big thing because as a 10 year old boy, I was quite shy and introvert. And this enabled me to, to come out of myself a little bit, which was which is great. So. Uh, so, yeah, full on. I think my mum and dad hoped that I'd come out of this thing. But no, it didn't. It <laughs> carried on. That's funny. So did you. So when did, was the desire to always go professional? Or was was it just a case of this is a really fun hobby that I enjoy doing? Um, and, and there wasn't any thoughts about becoming a professional magician or, you know, where, well, where was your process? Yeah, so I was about 16 and I was learning all of these tricks uh, and I got, I forget the name of the book, but I was learning card slides and I was doing classic passes and all sorts of cardy stuff. But I wasn't really putting it together in a sort of structured way which as a professional worker, as you well know, that is what you do. You routine stuff, you put stuff together. Um, and then I met a guy called Alan Rentcombe. And Alan Rentcombe is now based in America. He's got a proper job. Um, so he's like a CEO for a big electronics company, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we communicate via messenger or whatever. And, and he was a semi-professional magician. Okay. I'd never met another magician. And suddenly he started showing me things. I thought, oh my God, this is proper stuff because he was presenting it properly. And I went along and I watched him at a place called Spencer's Wine Bar, which is over in Essex. I don't think it's around now, but I went along and I watched him work and I thought, oh my God, this is what I want to do. This is just awesome. Uh, and he was working, I was watching how he was managing the crowd, interacting with them. And, and my level just went through, I, I was like, so mm. excited, so excited. Um, and that was it. And so I met, I met him and, and it just went to a whole new level. And is it that point that you kind of realized, actually, I could make a living doing this? This is something I could do. Well, I, I didn't. I just I didn't realize that people could actually earn money being a magician. Uh, that was the I just thought it was for these, you know, Paul Daniels and whatever on the telly. I, I just thought, well, it's all right for them. But that was I didn't realize there were working magicians out there. No idea. And he was doing it working alongside a job. And so I just thought, oh, OK, that's that's kind of cool thing to do. Uh, it was only later on that I realised that you could actually do it as a living. OK, so so when you finished school at the age of 16, did you go into higher education or did you get a job or uh, what, what kind of happened then? And did magic carry yeah. on? Because well, obviously when you start getting into full time employment or you start getting into university, whatever it is, it can sometimes kind of things that you've loved your whole life can drop away a little bit, can't they? Yeah, no, that didn't happen. Sorry about that. But I, <laughs> um, but I, um, I went to, yeah, I, I, my, my mum and dad idolised my brother. And, uh, and rightly so, because he's better looking and clever than me, which I get. <laughs> um, but my brother went along, so he went off and got qualified and did electrical engineering, got a great job, et cetera, et cetera. And so I wanted to follow my brother's footsteps. And luckily for me, believe it or not, I found math, science, that sort of thing, bit, a bit geeky, I guess. <laughs> I found that really quite easy at school. So I went off to college, I went, and then I joined, well, I, I got offered a student apprenticeship with the electricity board, as it used to be called, 
which meant that they paid for you to work for them and they paid for you to go to university. So I went to City University in London. I got myself a upper second class honours degree, get me, in electrical yeah. electronic engineering and went down this corporate route of in the electricity board and got quickly promoted through. But it wasn't scratching the itch. Um, and although yeah. I was earning good income coming in, I wasn't following my dream. Um, but at yeah. that stage, you know, I'm getting houses, relationships, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and and stuff's happening. And and the financial burden is there, which means mm, actually chucking that away and going into doing something risky. My mum and dad hated that idea but I was toying with this idea um, but anyway I, I went through and I was got all promoted through but I just looked at my boss and what he was doing and I just went do I really want to be doing that mm. no and I, I've got two beautiful daughters and I've always said to them the same don't follow the money follow your passion follow your dream um, and if you're good enough the money will follow and if you've got strong self-belief it will happen that's my believing and you know that's really, that's your, really you are exactly the same so you follow yeah. your passion and you go with it so I was pretty much the same and and I and I went from there and I went into believe it or not teaching or lecturing at a technical college and at that stage I started doing magic alongside the job so and up until then, you were the, you were the quintessential hobbyist practicing learning you know like 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 just getting good at the craft but you weren't actually going out doing gigs i find that really interesting sean because there's so many people that come into magic these days that rush into performing it's like they've learned five card tricks and they're like right okay i'm gonna go and do a gig now no it's interesting to see you 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 i mean we're talking you know you got into magic at 10 you know teach it when, when did the teaching thing start how old were you there um i was about 20 27 so, um, so that's like and I, 17 years. 27, and I, and I then turned full-time at 30. Okay, it's really interesting that you didn't do any gigs until you, uh, and, until you became a, uh, you know, a lecturer. That's really interesting. When you became a lecturer, was it, was it a, did you kind of have on your radar, I'm going to go full-time, and that's why you started doing gigs? Or was it a case of you have the time to do gigs, and like that, ultimately took over how how did that three-year period pan out of you being a lecturer because you say 27 okay. you became a lecturer 30 year at the age of 30 you became a full-time pro so what happened in that three-year right. period right so this is random so okay. I, like random. I was i was reading the local rag and i saw a advert that said do you want to be a magician are you joking <laughs> no. So I thought, what's this going? What's this? And it was a course at my local college being run by a guy called Sid Slavny. And I thought, OK, let's check this out. And Sid Slavny was basically a children's entertainer. And I went along and it was a six six week course. And, and I sat there watching Sid, and he was a great kids entertainer. He really was. He actually went on blind dates as well. Um, and, and he was a nightmare on it, quite honestly. But lovely man. Sadly, obviously, he's departed now. But he, was, he must have been then in his 70s when he was doing this course. Um, well, it was just before, say, I did his 70th party for him. So it was just before he was late. 60s so anyway I went along to this course and I sat there watching him all his interaction and I actually thought and this isn't meant big-headedly I just thought if this guy can earn a living doing magic so can I and that was it and I just thought wow this is an opportunity and so I learned loads of kid stuff from Sid and, and I developed an act and I went out and I was Sean Squiggle. Okay. There you go. And um, 
And so... I did not know you were a kid's entertainer at any point. Well, that, yeah. Um, so <laughs> it brought in the bacon. It brought in the bacon. I mean, at, at that time, um, it's a bit different now for children's entertainers, but I was doing, at a week, I was doing six shows over a weekend. I was absolutely heaving out, uh, loads of stuff coming in. Um, and it was great. So what happened during that three year period as a lecturer, I developed the magic as a sideline, developed it alongside the business. And this is a great tip for anyone looking to go full time. And what I did is I lived off my magic earnings and I banked the job money. And once I did that for six months, then you left the job. And it wasn't the money back up, it was in your head because most people, the thing that stops them is the thing between their ears. They don't yeah. believe that they can do it and earn a living. And I'd actually proved it over six months, you can do this. And, and that was it. And then away you, away you went. Killer. Um, so the kids magic thing was great and it brought in the bacon, but I still had that itch because kids magic is great, but that isn't my passion. Uh, so yeah but did you go full-time as a kids entertainer primarily if you were doing six shows a weekend doing a kids entertainer you probably didn't have much time to do close up so you were so you were doing so you would so you went full-time predominantly as a kids entertainer that's really interesting which is great so the money was up there you like you say bought in the bacon but you've got that desire to want to do more to be a, a, a you know serious magician whatever that may be how did you then transition from kids entertainment to close up and stage or whatever it is that yeah that... yeah so i think a little bit like most magicians when you're starting off you don't really know what your best thing is and so you buy a load of rubbish don't you 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 buy that buy this buy the other and and as you well know the magic market is mainly aimed at the hobbyist end rather than the pro workers um and so i'm buying loads of stuff and then you're trying it and, oh, well, that doesn't really fit with me. But you don't know really yeah. who you are. So I was buying lots of stuff, wondering, well, OK, what's the best fit? I even got doves. I thought, would I be a dove magician? <laughs> um, yeah. So I you was a dove magician, Sean, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it didn't work very long. So bought the Java doves very quickly. They went. Then I did a uh, an illusion show, so I bought Cube Zag and some other things, and I bought a van. Tried that glamorous assistant; it was all right, but that wasn't my thing either. Um, I did. I tried to be a comedy magician. No, um, yeah, that isn't my bet. Trying like the going around the holiday camp type thing, and and that wasn't my bag. And it just takes time. Um, and I used but to. You was, had that. You had that income from the kids' magic while you were trying to figure all this yeah, out. Yeah, right? and but I was at the with the kids thing. I I then got booked into doing weddings, and this was where the the hook for weddings. So I do now. I do typically between fifty and sixty weddings a year. I do. They, they don't want me there. I just turn up. It's great. I just cake. <laughs> bash, I like cake. So uh, I do a lot of weddings, and the wedding bug came from as a kids entertainer. I got booked to come along to entertain the kids at weddings. But I then went, well, I'll, I'll hold on, I can do some stuff around the tables. And I went around the tables and suddenly, oh, this is where I wanna be, this is it. And, um, and, and so that was where the inkling came in. Now at that stage, I'd, I'd met a, a guy, <clears throat> he's, a bit of a, he's a bit of a strange character actually, a bloke called Wayne Fox. Don't know if you know him. Oh, well, yeah, him. I mean, oh, you know hey. him? Foxy, yeah. everybody knows him, don't they? Yeah, <laughs> Wayne, Wayne's a really good buddy of mine, and we met at a place. Wayne called... is Wayne is so creative, such an exceptional magician. Yeah, he's really. Yeah, he's he's great. He's a he's a really good friend of mine, and I've known him thirty odd years. And we first met at a place called the Fez Club, and he was earning a living just doing close up magic. And again, that was a seed sow. Well, well, hold on, someone can actually earn a living doing this magic stuff but not doing kids stuff and it was then trying to wean yourself off of doing the kids magic which was easy money to then focus on doing what you actually loved so, so how did you wean yourself off it 
Because that's um, a question that comes up on this channel an awful lot. Because it's very easy to just, you know, like, take the kids' gigs, take the kids' gigs, take the kids' gigs. Because when you first start marketing yourself as a close-up magician, you might have a day killer. You might have a wedding that's a day killer. And you're kind of thinking, well, if I did my three kids' shows, it would make me more money than doing this one wedding. Like, what? Do, yeah. do you know what I mean? It's, I yeah, don't... totally. So I took, um, in the year 2000, I moved from, I was living in Hertfordshire, so at this time, I was doing, my core business was, I was doing lots of bar mitzvahs, loads of bar mitzvahs. Okay. So um, not that many, that, so the kids magic was, was still there, but it was, I was now getting into doing bar mitzvah work. And then I went on holiday to Norfolk, um, liked it. And I thought, well, actually what I do, I could live anywhere. So without okay, checking out... Yeah, without that's, checking that's, out. That's a really sorry. I was just saying that's a that's a really big sc scary thing to do, isn't it? Kind of like because you have set yourself up a base and a, a client base in one particular area, and then to go, you know, I'm just yeah, going to move. My personality trait is very much I'll I'll go by the seat of my pants and follow follow things, um, which drove my parents around the bend, of course, but because they were very sort of you know just stick down the line. I I don't mind taking risks. Um, I've always been self-confident i so i suppose so yeah. i just thought well actually i'll live there that's fine i can still commute i can still do stuff but yeah i didn't do much market research so i didn't find out that the uh, the going rate for magicians in norfolk is a little bit different than when you're based in chesson just outside london and <laughs> uh, and the population is slightly different as well so i moved and at that stage i thought hold on a minute this is this is big decision time. What do you do? And I took the decision then. I'm I'm getting rid of the kids' magic. I'm phasing it. I'm getting rid of it. Um, and I just focused then on the close-up magic. Did I take a financial hit? Yeah. But you probably had like some money built up. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, of course you do. Yeah. You you put stuff yeah. aside so that that's that's there to to bridge the gap. But nevertheless, it, it was a risk. But do you know what? I'm so pleased I did it. So pleased I did it. And that's that's the interesting thing about risks, isn't it, Sean? Which is like, you know, and I've talked about risks on the channel before. Personally, I'd, be, I'd rather be the sort of person that looks back and goes, I'm glad I did it, rather than be the person that looks back and goes, what if? You know, has every risk I've taken paid off? No. Would I be where I am right now if I'd taken no risks and played it safe my entire career? Not a chance. And, and I think that's a really important lesson that you, you, you're, you're talking about here, which is the importance of taking risks. If you're going to be entrepreneurial and anybody who runs their own business and, and being a self-employed magician is running your own business and anybody who runs their own business and is entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, you have to take risks from time to time if you want to get ahead, right? Yeah, you either live with fear or you live with regret. Yeah. And I didn't and I didn't want to live with regret. I didn't want to go to my last day thinking, what if I'd done X, Y, Z? I've given it a I've given it a go. And you do you know what? Like when COVID hit and, and all your business is gone, um, I had to go out and get a job. Ugh, sorry about that, you know, doing that thing that where you get paid regular income and you get holiday pay, you know, those sort of things. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I know. But I went and did that and it, oh my God. And it just made you realize how lucky you are doing something that you love with a passion and get paid for it because you never work a day in your life then. And that's the position I'm in now. I, I do what I love and it's just every day is a blessing. Well, that's amazing. But let's talk about, let's talk about what I alluded to at the beginning, because we've got to the point where you've, You've established yourself uh, over in Norfolk. You've, you know, you've, you've, you've moved and you, you, you're doing the sort of magic that you love to do. Um, you've dropped the kids shows. Everything's all good in the world. I alluded at the very beginning to the interview that you are a, a good business person. Let's talk about that briefly because I've had a couple of people on the channel that are equally as good. Last week I had Sam Fitton, who's obviously an incredible wedding magician. And, you know, there's been a few others, but uh, few and far between. So how important is it to focus on the business side of magic? Surely you can just become a magician 
and and join an agency and then just sit back and wait for them to call you right i guess you can right (laughs) yeah i've i've never ever i've never worked for agents so yeah every all my work is self-generated always has been so i suppose i come from from the electricity board and everything i come from a sales background anyway so every job you do you're a salesperson for yourself and whenever you're working that's a great opportunity you're showcasing what you do so first and foremost you've got to make sure that what you do is good Um, and then at the jobs you've got to obviously self you've got to promote yourself but not in a cheesy over the top way um actually also on your on performance side as you do as well obviously is it it's really important to take the focus off you it's not about look how clever i am it's about how you make people feel and if you do that and if you make your customers which are your spectators feel special and important and involved guess what? They like the experience and guess what? They recommend you and stuff and away you go. So recommendation is one of the strongest forms that I get. That's how I get most of my business from word of mouth that people have seen me or their friends have seen me, passed on the details and away you go. And that's such a cool way of getting business because ultimately you're not then fighting against other people for the same job. You're, you're the only person they've been recommended. So that is such a strong way to get business from word of mouth. So first and foremost, make sure your, your act is good, that you're not cheesy in your face. Hi. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Hi. Oh my God. You know, make your, (laughs) make your persona suit, your audience so that might be good that type of persona might be good in certain environments so for example and nothing against this a holiday camp type thing where you're hidey high type thing great fine <laughs> happy days yeah. but that isn't me so i'm doing corporate magic working at new market races blah 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 weddings all of that stuff so you've got to make sure that your act is appropriate for the audience you're you're dealing with and mm-hmm. then business cards you know silly things like business cards oh great hand them out uh, but again in a nice way so it's a great way and a making effects that are personalized to the client because again they like that and they talk about it so making the experience a personal thing for the people you're performing at so all of this is just looking at what you do when you're performing this is not looking at anything you do outside of the performing area so yeah um, so when you're looking outside of the performing area, there's lots of different ways that you can market. Um, and you are utilizing social media as a fantastic avenue to, to market. And congratulations yeah. on that. Absolutely blinding. Any form of social media marketing has got to be done on a consistent basis. And that's what you've done. You've done it on a consistent basis. You've got to keep on doing it. And again, it's a bit like when you're performing as a magician, you've got to repetition is the mother of skill. You keep practicing. And the same with, so if you're going to use social media, just keep doing posts over and over again. So if you're looking at Facebook, Twitter, whatever, whatever you're going to just regularly post, put stuff on there. If you get clips of you performing, do that as well. I think that's really, really important. I see a lot of people putting clips of themselves and, that, and I think that's great. And it's so easy to do. So easy to do. You can, somebody will have a phone, they'll do a clip. Oh, do you mind if you just video that? Can you pass me the clip? Yeah, it's so, so simple to, to do. Um, so all of this stuff is quite easy. It's quite easy. You can um, yeah, do that, but it takes discipline. Then there's other things that you can do. So you, you mentioned about a thing called B&I. You was in B&I as well, weren't you, Craig? Yeah, I mean, I've been in networking for years. I started off in BNI. I, I ended up uh, and still kind of um, with Brad Burton just because his style kind of fits me more. I know that for networking or Network Central as they're now known and uh, BNI don't really see eye to eye at the best of times, but I like both business models. But for me, the way I am, they're more relaxed and kind of more social than BNI, which is very, very... And the other problem with BNI is I got to a point, I did it for like four years and I love it. I'd recommend it to anyone, but I got to a point with BNI where you obviously have to go every single week. 
and I was doing a lot of gigs where I was traveling away in the week and I was finding myself sending substitutes in every week and it was like well this just isn't working for me because I'm not able to attend I'm not able to get the most out of this than I would be if if I was there every week so that's when I kind of went for the network central for networking route because they're more flexible and you can go anywhere around the UK so okay yeah I mean I've uh... If I just give my, so I was in b and I'm not in b and anymore. So after lockdown uh, happened, there was no point being in a referral marketing business where you can't get any work uh, apart yeah, from well, doing online stuff. Right? Yeah, and, and online stuff was fine. And I know people did it, but for me, that wasn't my bag. I, I didn't, that wasn't it. I, I, I like the, the interaction. So, um, yeah. so yeah. So I stopped being a member of BNI. Uh, it did actually make me reflect on that type of business model for marketing. So mm-hmm. um, I then decided, and I've not rejoined BNI. Now BNI is a is a for people that don't know BNI is a a referral marketing business. It's not networking. You've got a big network, but it's not networking as such. So there's other networking groups where people turn up. Why do they turn up? because they want to sell their stuff. And most people make the mistake of going to networking meetings to sell. But nobody buys at a networking meeting. Nobody buys. Your key thing when you go to a networking meeting is to identify people that maybe you could work with and build a relationship with so you can swap contacts between each other. That's the key thing. But I see that most people don't do that. Most people will go in there, they'll try to say, oh, yeah, I'm a magician. Yeah. Have you got a wedding coming up? Here you go. And the person on the other end doesn't really give a monkeys. They're not interested because yeah. they're trying to sell to you. And it and it back. So you've got to approach it in the right way. And you have got to be quite chilled and relaxed. BNI is a is more structured than most. Uh, and it's really great as a model. But. You've got to work hard at it. And it's the same in any form of marketing. You've got to work hard. And with b and mm. it's very, very suited for tradespeople's, accountants, things that people can get their head around quite easily. I understand what a plumber does. Ah, I need a plumber. But when you say you're a professional close-up magician, yeah, right. What's that all about? I, like I don't one, quite yeah. get that. Um, and a lot of people in BNI will give soft referrals to each other. That's into, oh, I need a bunch of flowers for my mum. I need this, that, and the other. But they can't say, oh, do you know what I really need? He's a top quality close-up magician. I've got a corporate event coming up. Uh, no, that doesn't happen. So it will cost you probably around about 1,200 quid, 1,300 pound to join. Then you've got, on top of that, your room costs then you've got your daily your weekly expense then you've got to go out and do what they call one-to-ones so when you budget all of that in you're probably mm, three to four grand investment do you get a return on that yes you do but you've got to work very hard for it yeah so i personally think there's better ways for magicians to market themselves rather than by the bni route it worked for me, worked for my business. It's why I did yeah. it for so long. But uh, you got to remember when you when 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 to get out. You know, it can it can be the sort of thing that can be a labour. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. But the whole concept of networking and building up a and, and the thing with networking, we're getting into business now. But the thing with networking, it doesn't have to be a networking event. You can be networking anywhere. You go down um, your friend's school. Um, you, you go down your kid's school, for example, and you're taking your kid to a football match or something, and you're standing next to a parent and you're chatting to that parent, that's networking. You know, you're building up relationships with people. And I think the most important thing I learned from networking is never judge a book by its cover. You never know who that person can connect you to. Just because the person you're speaking to is a cleaner, for example. Well, what office do they clean and what's their relationship with the person who cleans that office or who's their sister? And the biggest contract I ever got came from a cleaner 
Um, like it's a contract that I've had for years that's worth literally hundreds of thousands of pounds. And it came as a result of having a conversation with a cleaner who put me in touch with somebody. You know, you never know who you're speaking to. Don't judge a book by its cover. Absolutely. So. And, and again, if anyone, for example, a very simple tip, here you go. Um, if you're at a wedding, are there other wedding suppliers there? Yeah. So these guys do weddings. I do weddings. So doesn't it therefore make sense that you build a relationship with those guys? And maybe when they get a wedding referral or they get an inquiry, they go, oh, do you know what? Yeah, I was with this guy. He does mad blah, 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 blah. So yeah. you build relationships with people that have the same client base as you. So build relationships with other wedding suppliers, other people in the entertainment thing. Also, don't be afraid of building relationships with other magicians because actually we're all in it together and quite often I, if I can't do stuff I'll refer people on and then guess what that comes back uh, and so it's all about cultivating relationships and it's such an easy thing to do and it costs you nothing bang boom exactly so let me let me ask you another question you you've, you've obviously nailed the business side of things um, you're in, you're living in Norfolk. You you you're, you're marketing yourself. You're you're fine for gigs. You're doing really well. You're living your ideal life. You know you're doing your dream job and everything's great. Where did creativity come into this? Because obviously you lecture. You've created your own magic for magicians. How did that come about? Because and I, this is a question that I'm always interested in hearing the answer to, and I've asked it to quite a few people on Talk Magic because it it really kind of interests me. And the reason is, it, it's fair to say that you didn't have money problems when you started creating magic. You were in Norfolk, everything was going well, um, you know, you're marketing your business, you're not short of the odd gig or two, everything's fine. So why would you start creating magic? Surely it's like, okay, I'm going to create this, you keep it for yourself. Why would you, why would you give it to the community, especially somebody who doesn't really hang out that much with magicians. I know you do in your local area, but we talked off camera. You don't go to Blackpool. You don't really do that side of things. No. So how did you fall into the creativity side of the industry? Yeah, that's, that's down to my mate, Wayne Fox. Go, he's got a lot of answers for oh, He's responsible for so much stuff, isn't he, Fox? I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he's also responsible for getting into getting me into the love of coin magic. And I know you love coin magic as well. So, um, yeah, Wayne's got a lot to answer for. So, of course, he's so good at everything else. People don't think of Wayne as a coin guy, but good God, he is. Oh, he's, a, he's an amazing coin guy. And yeah, as I say, I mean, that's a totally different story how I sort of got involved in that. But um, so, Wayne, um, again, Wayne lives in sort of um, Wolf and Cross area, so uh, north ish London. And I used to live in Chesson. So, we used to hang around quite a bit and uh, and he was working alongside a guy called Keelan, Keelan um, Lazy um, that does Quick yeah, Change. who now does the Quick Change Act but at the time ran Magic Tricks. That's it, yeah. And, and, and Wayne was chatting to me about that he'd released some things with him and, uh, and how he was really enjoying it and I thought oh, okay um, and I create as you do I create quite a lot of stuff myself and so I ran a couple of things I went I, I met with Keelan and I went oh well I've got this what do you think and he went oh my god that could be great and and that was genetics and I'd been performing genetics for years and the first how it first came about was when I was at school and I was trying to learn um, French words le and la and I'd learnt a lot on the back of cards, and then I had the thing on, and that was where the idea of genetics came from. And, and I showed him on these rubbishy old cards that I'd made up, and he went, oh my God, that's great, that would be really, really good, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I just thought, hey, how cool would that be to release a magic trick for a magician? And it was just, was I thinking about the money side? No. It was just the thought of, hey, wouldn't this be kind of cool to get your name on something? Uh, because I don't, I'm not a big, you know, magician-y, magician's person. I, my audience are lay people. That's who, that's who pays my money. 
Um, but I just thought, wouldn't it be kind of nice to just get your name out there? So, and I always did fancy doing lectures. I did fancy that because I, again, come from a teaching background and I like sharing things. Again, that ties in with being, I like giving stuff back. So that was where the drive from creating stuff was. The biggest creation for me personally, and my house is named after it as well, was Secret is Secret Savant, which is my holdout. And uh, yeah, well, that blew up, and it's an incredible device. Yeah, and and that came out of necessity, to be honest. So um, I wanted to to be able to perform a. It was a copper silver routine with coins. So um, and I wanted to be able to ditch and retrieve gimmicks and then ditch the gimmick and there was nothing out there there was nothing out there that I, I, I looked all over the place there was plenty of coin droppers but then there was nothing that you could put it back in and then pull it out and this that and the other and so that was that that creation was driven by a need very much so so um genetics I just developed it and someone went well oh, that's kind of good away we went um, but Secrets of Amp was from necessity, very much so. Uh, some of the other things that I've created have been from, again, me just toying around with ideas, really, and then things just pop out. And you've got a lot of the stuff that you create, especially these days, uh, it's self-published, isn't it? You don't go through a production company like a Penguin or a Vanishing Ink, or am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, the, the last thing that I produced was uh, an effect called Duo, which was is, is the first coin routine that I've actually sort of published. Uh, I did that in conjunction with Mark, um, Mark at Saturn Magic. Um, so, but all the other things really before that, I just did myself and then so I've got a relationship with with Murphy's so they send stuff over there so they know me um and yeah so I then marked it myself brilliant so it's not I, I mean you see some creators that just bring out stuff constantly all the time like you just see every week there's something seemingly coming out from them that doesn't seem to be the case with you is it a case of creating is kind of a side thing and if something comes up then you'll you'll yeah. look to market it. but it's not something that you actively sit down and make part of your business model right no it isn't it it's not part of my business plan it's um it's it's the fun aspect of it everything that i've released to be fair it, the same as yours craig and i'm not blowing smoke up your backside all your stuff is working material it is yeah. so when something that you release comes on I know as a working magician, it's going to be stuff that I would potentially use. So I'm just waiting for forecast. I was hoping to have that so I could go, da -da, here's forecast. So <laughs> I've ordered that, okay, because it's working stuff. So everything that I produce is stuff that I do. So it means a lot to me. I'm, I'm passionate about it because it's part of my soul that goes into it. So I know yeah. there's people that produce stuff purely so that they can sell it, so people get it, and then they go, hmm, that goes in the drawer. Well, I don't want that. I want people, this is stuff that I perform. So if people are looking for solid, workable material that has been worked, that's my stuff. And when I lecture, it's exactly the same. All the stuff that I show, it's working material. So when I lecture, they get like me in performance mode. It's just like me performing to real people, except magicians don't react like real people, do they? Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, but I'm, I'm over that. I'm okay. Like, it's it's fine. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a passion of love creation. I totally get that. I totally get that. So are, are you working on anything else at the moment in terms of... Uh... Uh, creating magic have you got another thing that you're working on that's going to be coming out at some point in the next few months or um year? i've got a couple of ideas but they're certainly not ready for for putting out there yet so um but again i it's you tinker around with things but until it's right and i've performed it lots and lots of times i won't even think about it so at the moment i've got a few things in there um but uh, watch this space. That's really cool. Brilliant stuff. 
So I, I suppose one of the most, are you there still? Yeah. Oh, you're there. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. One yeah. of the most important questions I want to ask you. Yeah, I thought you disappeared there. Um, the most important question I want to ask you, and this is a question I ask everybody on the channel that comes on for an interview, is what's next, Sean? Like you say, you took a job during COVID, as most entertainers did, but now we're finding that with hopefully things, um, you know, gone away and everything getting back to normal, at least here in the UK, um, that, that, that work is coming in and it's getting busy and it's getting busy and it's getting busy, which is fantastic. Um, you're, you're back performing full time. What, what goals do you have? moving forward both in terms of a magician and a creator so is there anything left on your magical bucket list that you want to achieve we've already talked about how yeah you're very is. successful in business yeah okay but... i'm interested in what that is yeah uh, so the uh, first of all i believe that one of the, if, if there's anyone that is watching this that is maybe thinking well it'd be quite nice to to do magic as a as a full-time thing one of the uh, if i just run through some of the benefits of it uh, and i'm talking to the converted with yourself um one of the the biggest motivations for me were my were my children i've got two daughters sabrina and kelly both incidentally yeah. strangely named after charlie's angels in the the original charlie's <laughs> angels which is a bit <laughs> a bit a bit strange but there you go that wasn't intentional but but that that's both of their names so but i wanted as a dad never to miss their school sports day. Now that might sound a bit wet and weak. I don't really care. No, it doesn't at all. I don't care because my children are and were my priority. And when I used to go to the school and look around, I was the only dad there. Yeah. And that wasn't an opportunity for me to hit on all the mums, <laughs> not at all. But I was the only dad there. And that was one of the benefits of having your own business, and being able to schedule your time. So things that are really important to you, you schedule them in. And with a job, many jobs don't let you do that. So that was absolutely priceless for me. So on, on that subject, before you continue, I just want to point out, that's why I stopped doing wedding fairs. I stopped doing wedding fairs for that exact same reason, because I was working every Saturday and on the Sundays that had off, I was running around all day doing a wedding fair. And I was like, I'm never seeing the kids. I'm, I just got to be a better way to get weddings where I'm not actually killing myself every Sunday. That's, that's why I stopped doing wedding fairs. Yeah, right it's about getting this work-life balance. And so, um, so talking about work-life balance, one of my second passions is I love golf. Am I any good at it? I'm all right, I'm not brilliant. But I love it and I love the banter and I love the crack. And again, having that flexibility to be able to do something as a hobby without worrying about the time implications. Oh, it's just gold. It's just beautiful. So, yeah, I can go off and I'm playing golf with all these guys. They've all retired. They say, have you retired? No, I'm still working. Um, but I work at <laughs> different time things. But I'm lucky enough to, when I do work, I get well paid for it. And so you've got this work-life balance and it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I don't get holiday pay, I don't get sick pay, but if you're smart, work your business, you put stuff aside and everything, and you, you cope with that, you deal with it. But yeah, one do. thing I would love to do, and I'm very jealous of you, Craig, in a very Why? nice way, because I know you're <laughs> off to America. And yes, one of the things yes, I that I would love to do is I'd love to do a lecture tour around America. And I'd love to perform mm. at the Magic Castle. So there are a couple of things certainly on my, on my bucket list. And I'd love to go out there with the wife and, uh, and stuff. Uh, one of the things that, um, again, so, uh, I mean, you've lectured at the Magic Circle several times and everything. So... For me, that was a big highlight when I went and lectured at the Magic Circle, 14th of November 2016. Not as though it's a date engraved in me. Um, but again, it's just little old me that I don't promote myself really to, I, I don't do that. But to do that, that was a real big thing. And that thought, oh, wouldn't that be great to do that over in America? Yeah. So if there's anyone listening from America, yeah. 
Hook me up. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you speak to uh, Sean Dunn of Penguin Magic? He, he. Uh, do you know Sean? No. Okay, I'll hook you guys up. I'll hook you guys up. Beautiful. There you go. Bit of, net, bit of networking. Real time example of networking. Yeah, I'll, I'll hook you guys up. That will. Um, I, I, I think Sean would love you. I know he would. Cool. And and I, I meant. I know this is going to come up in the comments, so I'm going to bring it up. What I, I mentioned earlier briefly that we spoke off camera, and you said you've never gone to the Blackpool Magic Convention. How come? And. Would you, you know, you talked about wanting to lecture in America and you, you got very excited about lecturing at the uh, Magic Magic Circle. If Blackpool rang you up and said, hey, Sean, I would like to book you for a lecture. Um, would, would you do that? Damn right. Oh, I'd be all over that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, what, what does actually make me giggle a little bit and um, it's sometimes when, when you see people lecturing and they're lecturing after doing about a year performing and now yeah. doing a lecture and um, and and so i get you know when i lecture i lecture solid close-up working material from a working magician that's been professional for 28 years in the business so if that's of interest to people i think that's okay i think people pick up stuff um but it does amaze me when I look at all these lecturers and, and some of them, you know, my God, they look they look younger than whatever. And, and nothing against that. It's fine. Um, but yeah. So, yeah, if Blackpool rang me up, I'd love to. But but then, Craig, I'm not a big name in the magic fraternity. So um, so I get that as well. And that and that's my own doing, to be perfectly honest, because I don't go out there and push my name out really to magicians i don't really do that well again it's knowing about the fact that you've only got a certain amount of time in the day and you can't do everything and and you know your your business has always been performing to real people and so if you spend time marketing yourself in an area that you don't really do much in it's going to be detrimental to your business i would imagine yeah yeah so that that's been the the avenue however that might well change because um yeah so that might change but i haven't made that decision as yet well i'm sure if it ever will change it would be hanging around with wayne fox i mean he's a guy <laughs> who is incredibly well known in the uh in the uh you know in the magic industry everybody knows who wayne fox is he's, so uh, he's, you know he's doing pretty well for himself, he's, he's Brilliant. Um, just a little story. I, I first met Wayne and also Martin Cox. Do you know Martin? I love Martin. I actually uh, was with him, I think, at Blackpool. And uh, he, I, we don't really know each other, uh, but I'm a huge fan of his work, like a huge fan. And I think I blew him away a little bit because I just turned around to him and I said, hey, Martin, as far as I'm concerned, you're one of the best comedy magicians on stage I've ever seen. And you make me laugh my ass off every single time I watch you. I wish I was half as good as you are. Like, and he, I think he was a bit taken aback that I just said this out the blue. And we'd never really spoken before, but I mean it. I think Martin Cox is freaking hilarious. Yeah, he's, he's a funny guy. And, and he set up a magic club in Hertfordshire called the Fez Club. And, and so I was a fledgling, this new wannabe, this was just before I was turning pro. Um, and, I, and I turned up there and I met all of these people. And my close up repertoire was card trick after card trick after card trick after card trick. And fair play to, you know, lots of entertainers do card trick after card trick after, card, oh, sorry, wake up. Um, nothing against that, um, but I think that magic for me is a little bit like a diet. I think it should be varied. And for me as a performer going out. So if you're a, a hobbyist and you love cards, not a problem. You're performing card tricks because you love it. Me as a professional going out there, earning my living doing magic, sometimes not everyone likes card tricks. And so being it's able to offer different things is great. And also what makes you different from every other magician? If you're doing the same old stuff, it might be a slightly different card trick, but in the, perform in the spectator's eyes, it's a card trick. 
So try and do some things that are a little bit different. So anyway, so I went into the Fez Club, met Martin. Oh, it's on, Henry! What? Whoa, who the hell's this guy? <laughs> um, and then I met this guy, and he didn't have sunglasses on his head then, and he had a little bit more hair, um, Wayne Fox. And mm-hmm. he started doing coin magic for me. And I'd never seen this before. And I went into schoolboy jaw drop. What the hell's just <laughs> happened? Everyone else was doing card tricks and Wayne did coins. And, and I was, I just thought, this is real magic. This is unbelievable stuff. Um, and again, he did stuff. And one of my, again, the favorite magicians of mine, Michael Lamar. Michael Lamar says the most convincing magic is when it's done slowly. It's not fast. It's not Mm -hmm. gymnastics. You're not trying to, you know, look how clever I am. Look how fast I can cut stuff and do. It was slow. And I just was blown away. Uh, And he then linked me into David Roth's expert coin technique book. Um, I went on some workshops with David, very fortunate to meet meet David, God rest in peace, finest coin magician ever to live, in my humble opinion. Without a doubt, um, absolutely. Amazing doubt. guy. Um, and that was where my love of coins came in. And and I guess I've got to be careful when I perform, because if I had my way, I'd just do coin magic all the time. But I don't. I mix it all up, and I, and I still do card stuff as well. So I'm not... But I do laugh at my lecture because the lecture that I do at the moment, I do one card trick and everything else isn't cards. So um, so I warn them at the beginning. If you're looking for a load of card tricks, forget it. You're not going to get them. <laughs> well, you know what? I was speaking to Eric Jones on this channel, who's obviously an incredible coin magician. Yeah. And, and him and I both had the discussion about coin magic. And the thing for me is that... Um, uh, you have to establish credibility with your audience when you're doing close-up magic. And if you pull out a deck of cards and go, hey, pick a card, they're probably going to think I've seen this one before, even if they don't tell you. But you do something with a coin. You make a coin appear out of the air or do a flurry or something. Immediately, it's different to anything they've seen before. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 just different and, and also generally most coin routines are relatively short sharp punchy so there's a lot of magic concentrated in a short period of time so there's an opener in effect to establish your credibility coins are really cool really good but bang 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 you can hit people but you can also do it as a longer effect and you get full audience participation uh, and one of the strong you know any anything that happens in the spectator's hands that is an emotional response that they get and people remember emotional stuff and they'll mm-hmm. remember you so anything that involves the spectator is just gold and and um, coin magic links in with that as does card magic you know again you need to do card magic in my humble opinion that involves people gets them in you know the, the same sort of thing yeah i totally agree with you completely agree 100 percent so this has been a really good interview. <laughs> this has been an exceptional oh, interview. Thank you. I'm so glad that we've been able to get you on the channel because you are a fountain of knowledge. Like, the, like you say, you know, you've been here, done that, bought the T-shirt more than once. And there's very few lecturers that go out there that have as much experience as you as a performer and as a business person, as a creator. And, it, you know, it's just been fantastic that you've got to come on the channel and share your share, share, share some golden nuggets. I really appreciate it, Sean. Um, if people want to uh, connect with you, like they want to buy some of your effects and, you know, you've, got, you've released some amazing effects over the years. We've talked about secrets of arms. Genetics is still a modern classic, in my opinion. Lots and lots of other stuff. Do you have an online shop yourself that people can buy stuff from? Or is yeah. it a case of going to magic dealers? Let's, let's pimp your stuff out, Sean. Where, where can people go to buy your bits and pieces? Yeah, all right. I've got a little bit of magic. I'll sell you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, now you're doing Wayne impressions, it seems, as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do a little bit of, bit of Wayne. Duncan and David. 
Um, Wayne's, if, if you've ever met Wayne's, uh, Wayne's dad, oh, oh dear, oh dear, he's all right, mate, all right. It, he's exactly <laughs> like that. He's like a Del Boy, he's brilliant, great guy. Uh, so yeah, my I think you probably see on my my background is www.simplymagic.co.uk. So that's yeah. my my website, uh, and on there there's a bit for magicians, so people can sort of go on there and have a little look around. And there's some stuff on there. Uh, my latest thing, Duo. I don't sell that directly. That is purely from Saturn Magic. So okay. um, so yeah, I don't do that one. Um, so with respect to to Saturn, so that's that's that. Uh, but some of my other bits and pieces are all on there as well. There is some unpublished routines that I did for the lecture, uh, which are coin effects and, and everything. Uh, they're not on the website, but I need to put them on. But uh, but yeah, so people can so message me directly, which I have because I, I pop things on social media and people ask me about them uh, and and I, and I let people know, yeah, you can have it for X, Y, Z. Brilliant. OK. And um, if somebody wants to book you for a lecture, uh, there's a guy in America that's looking for an amazing lecturer. And he's oh. now found out that you are passionate about going and performing in America or Russ Brown. I know Russ Brown and Russ Stevens listen to this, listen to most of the talk magic. So, you know, the guys that book the Blackpool lecturers, they're, they're listening to this right now. Sean, where Brilliant. do they go? Yeah, that'd be that'd be awesome. That'd be amazing. Where did they go? Where did they go? Where did they send you a message? Yeah, just got again, just go straight onto my website. Um, drop me a message. You know, if they're daring enough, they can pick up the phone. Why why don't people like talking now as well? Do you get that as well? When people yeah. they send messages and uh, and stuff, and, and I much prefer to talk to people. So yeah, if they want to give us a buzz, more than welcome. Um, my can I share my phone number? Hell yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. even put it at the bottom. So, hell yeah, I'll even put it at the bottom of the screen for you, mate. Hell yeah, yeah. So <laughs> my mobile number, which is the one that's the best one, is 07907 213498. That's 07907 213498. That's obviously UK. So add plus four four if you're phoning from greater afield. And uh, just so you know, little known fact about Sean, he's an insomniac and stays up until two or three o'clock in the morning every morning. So if you feel the need to <laughs> phone him at three o'clock in the morning, do so. He'll be awake. I love he it. Phone call at that time. Nothing, so, nothing yeah. better than, yeah, nothing better. <laughs> That's awesome. And Instagram, are you on Insta? Yeah, yeah, on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, I haven't ventured into TikTok yet. Are you doing TikTok? I'm, on, I'm not big. I've got about 80,000 followers on TikTok. Oh, not, only 80,000. No, I mean, that's nothing on TikTok. Oh, is it? Yeah. I don't. You know, <laughs> I've got, I've got, no, I, I don't have, I, you know, I'm not a TikToker. I put stuff on there, but uh, not exclusive content. It just repurposed stuff from um, from Facebook. So, yeah. And, and okay. YouTube. Yeah. I've done, so, yeah, on Instagram, uh, on Facebook as well. If you're in Facebook, it's, uh, if you type in Sean Goodman Magician, very creative i know and you'll find me and there'll be there's lots of lots of stuff on there uh, performance shots so um not performance shot in front of a video here we are i don't need to worry about angles and things like that <laughs> and don't you just love the the videos particularly so laughing at this of the headless man have you seen these ones like with the coins you can never yeah. see the person. Here we are. I can see your fingers. Yes, you're a very skillful man, but I don't see your face. Um, that'd be really, really fun. I'd love to put some of those people in a, a real performing environment. So here we go. Pop you into a corporate thing. Go and entertain those people with that single coin vanish that you're selling for $20. Marvellous. <laughs> exactly. I completely agree with you. Or the wonderful crotch shot where the camera's just at your crotch the entire time as you're doing twisting the aces. That's another Beautiful. good one as well. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like that. Sean, this has been an incredible interview. Thank you so much for coming on the channel. I want Pleasure. everybody to go and buy your stuff and uh, uh, subscribe to any social media platform that you're on. More importantly, guys, leave a comment down below. You know, it, it takes a lot of time to do these talk magics and edit them. And it takes a lot of time for the people that are coming on here for an interview uh, to say their two pence worth. And it's always fantastic. So if you get time to just leave a comment down below, I know Sean will read the comments and it's always really nice to leave comments that the uh, person being interviewed can read. Outside of that, 
one more time, Sean, thank you so much for coming on the channel. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure we'll see each other again in real life at some point. And whatever you bring out in the future, I'll be there uh, first in line to buy it because you rock. Thank you. And the first thing I'm going to do now is go downstairs because I've heard the postman's been and I'm going to get forecast. So I'm looking forward go. to playing with that. Well, you already you already know Mnemonica, so you should have no problem with it at all. So you'll you'll be up and running immediately. It's the um, routines. That's the key thing. The routines are the thing. So a lot of people, they're looking about forecast and this, that, and the other and the teaching methods. Look, it's the routines that come with it. That's what you're paying the money for. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's always been the thing with me as well. And hopefully you'll like it. <laughs> I will like so, it, without a doubt. Thanks so much. Brilliant. Guys. Leave a comment down below. I will be back again tomorrow with a. This is going up, I believe, on Tuesday. So I'm going to be back Wednesday. I'm going to be back Wednesday with a uh, review show with my sidekick, Ryland. We'll be doing a review show. And uh, there's also going to be a magic live. And then at nine o'clock, we're also going to have a hidden gem. So check out those four videos tomorrow. Four videos tomorrow. Check those out. I'll be back again soon. My name's Craig. On behalf of Sean, we'll see you again. See you later. Mm -hmm.